An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 16, July 17th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, today I would like to turn to the last of the Cartesian postulates and its relation to dialectical thought, namely the postulate of completeness and thus the problem of system. This is a problem which has certainly not received sufficient attention in the course of our reflections so far. Although there is no question, if we take the idea of the power of the whole in the particular with the full weight and seriousness it deserves, that the idea of system as ultimately the sole guarantee of truth cannot be eliminated, at least from the Hegelian conception of dialectic. And here I would just like to draw your attention to the question which we shall have to consider very seriously during these, during these last sessions, and one for which I shall certainly not be able to afford you any straightforward solution. The question is this, what happens to the concept of dialectic once the concept of system has become seriously problematic? The fourth of Descartes' axioms and his last rule was in all cases to make enumerations to complete and reviews so general that I should be certain of having omitted nothing. Now I believe that if you want a really vivid idea of what should properly be understood by rationalism, a vivid idea of that moment which the subsequent and especially Kantian critique of rationalism described as its dogmatic element, you can recognize this in a nutshell and in very concrete form in this particular proposition of Descartes and without actually having to mull over those general features which are said to characterize the basic philosophical schools. For this demand already betrays an entirely dogmatic assumption which does not actually appear intelligible at all. This is the assumption that, in order really to possess that completeness which Descartes regards as the authentic criterion of binding truth, you can be quite sure that all of the elements which you are dealing with and have to reckon with are also in fact completely known to you. But this assumption is actually valid only under very specific conditions such as those which are perhaps most obviously provided by mathematics. Now, I do not wish to get involved in fundamental questions of mathematics here, and I believe since the introduction of set theory in particular, that things are by no means so simple in the realm of mathematics either. At any rate, even from the mathematical point of view, we can say that, that, ax that this axiom of completeness can tacitly be assumed only where we are dealing with definite manifolds. Furthermore, we may say that, in general, the pursuit of knowledge can follow this procedure only if it has a guarantee that, apart from the elements involved, the axiom, axiom of completeness. No further elements will emerge for knowledge, or if it has decided, arbitrarily as it were, to cut off the possibility of any further elements emerging, and has thus contented itself in advance with the order of what is already there. In other words, if you apply the axiom of completeness beyond the extremely narrow mathematical domain in which it was conceived, then you are dealing with a reification of knowledge in a precise sense, which I can perhaps clarify for you with this example, now that we have already employed the concept of reification rather frequently. For here we find a third term, as it were, that intrudes between knowledge itself and the object of knowledge a sort of order or principle which is arbitrarily imposed upon the matter itself from the side of the subject, a kind of schematism, we might say, which disturbs the immediate experience, the immediate relationship of knowledge to its object, and which, if you like, actually arrests that, re that relationship. Thus, this principle of completeness, which is indeed clearly identical with the principle of an all-embracing system, can meaningfully be applied only when it has already been decided through an arbitrary cognitive act that our knowledge may reach this far and no further, that a certain order can then be established in material which has been prepared through this regulated conceptual process. If you do not enter this qualification, if you do not therefore observe this demand for completeness, then the axiom of completeness actually becomes a mere dogma. That is to say, it is assumed as a binding truth that the knowing mind could be certain in and of itself. In an almost magical way, we should have to say that all the elements whose unity it is supposed to establish and which knowledge is supposed to encompass 
are also in fact already given to us in a complete and seamless fashion. If you like, you can regard the efforts of post-Kantian German idealism, and paradoxically even the efforts of Hegel himself, as an attempt to resolve this dilemma, to confront this, to confront this extraordinary difficulty in the following way. The material that presents itself to be known, which we cannot initially be sure is capable of being incorporated within a fully systematic context, is itself spun out of consciousness, as it were, and the attempt is made to, de to deduce from consciousness that in, which much, that in which such order is subsequently supposed to be exhibited. Thus, in a certain sense, the radical intention of German idealism, of resolving objectivity entirely into subjectivity, or, more precisely put, of resolving all that exists entirely into the absolute character of spirit, could find its justification precisely in terms of this systematic requirement, that is to say, in the requirement which is stipulated by Descartes here in a merely dogmatic manner, the idea of justifying this kind of completeness through the constructive process of knowledge, through the way the theory of knowledge itself is grounded, namely the idea of determining knowledge itself as something which in a sense is entirely independent of what would simply be out there as something which takes up everything into itself for the simple reason that it ultimately produces everything out of itself. But then this gives rise to the difficulty, as we are thrown from Scylla to Cherubdis, as it were, which is what knowledge is really supposed to mean, what, we can really, what can really be said to know if the sum of knowledge as such is nothing but the sum of what is already known. In other words, the question is whether this strictly realized identity does not actually transform all knowledge into a single tautology, and whether by thus merely repeating itself, it does not actually frustrate what it sets out to achieve, namely the knowledge of something with which it is not itself identical. Hegel also tried to resolve this problem, as I have already suggested to you, by asserting the non-identity, the persisting distinction the persisting distinction of subject and object in every individual moment, and by making this specific contradiction, namely the non-identity of the judgment and the thing which it, which it intends, and thus the inevitable failure of the individual judgment which affirms such an identity into the motor which drives the individual judgment beyond itself, and thus ultimately constitutes the system itself in a comprehensive sense. I do not wish to go into this idea any further here, but would prefer to say something to you about the way in which dialectical thought should proceed if it remains critically aware of the problems which arise at this point, and if it no longer dogmatically stipulates the completeness of all elements invoked in knowledge, or involved in knowledge. Since we can never be sure of the completeness of our knowledge, if we cannot say whether, the, whether new elements of knowledge will not constantly emerge in what is already given, for every object harbors an infinite wealth of aspects, and there is no need to add anything new here precisely because the matter itself offers infinite newness in every moment. How are we to respond if we are not to proceed in a simply non-consensual manner, if we are not simply to surrender in a bluntly empirical way to everything new in each particular case, if we do not actually wish to renounce knowledge altogether? Now I would say that while we should not strive for completeness of knowledge, neither should we of course simply isolate our individual cognitive acts, merely registering things in a static and thus unconnected form with lacks, which lacks any relationship to the whole. And dialectic is a trick, if you can forgive me this looser mode of expression, or perhaps at least an attempt to square the circle which this problem presents to you just as dialectic as a whole is essentially the attempt to resolve the paradox of identity in non-identity, not just by coming to a standstill here, but by unfolding and advancing through these elements. I would therefore say that the authentic task of philosophical thought is to furnish certain models, rather than trying to embrace everything, rather than yielding to the chim chimerical demand not to leave anything out something which is closely related anyway to that pedantic petite bourgeois need for absolutely continuous step-by-step -step conception of thought which i described for you during the last se session philosophy should effectively be concerned with constructing models 
end if I express this last time by saying that the substance of philosophy, the substance of thought, lies not in its supposed thesis or its individual proposition, but in the source of illumination which stands behind the thought and falls upon the individual objective moments in each case. This also applies to what I am saying to you at this moment. This source of illumination, this cone of light, falls in fact upon individual and specific objects, which it brings out. Here, if you like, it indeed resembles positivism, but does so in such a way that the cognition of the particular thing also casts light, or is reflected in turn upon all other objects which there are. In contrast to the merely limited sort of correctness, which is involved in procedures of identification and observation, I would say that the criterion of philo philosophical truth lies in how far it is capable of moving from something specific already known to us to shed further light upon a range of other things, lies in how far the activity of knowing is driven onwards from the center of cognitive force. It is this cognitive intention which allows illumination to transpire from the perspective of particular knowledge rather than mere subsumption under a cover concept, which has effectively been shaped by an administrative mentality that seems to me to be the essential concern of philosophy. Perhaps it is worth in pointing out that what I am saying to you here, and which may strike some of you as rather audacious, can in a sense also be found in the theories of knowledge defended by two of the most influential thinkers of the previous generation, who were also aware that, while the traditional conception of system was indeed inadequate, the mere subsumption of the individual under general concepts, namely the mere classification of what happens to be given, was certainly not sufficient either. I am thinking of two thinkers who have very little connection with one another in terms of their influence and their explicit intellectual positions, but whose teachings I would like to touch upon for a moment here precisely in order to show you that what I have just formulated for you in a very extreme way is not some impulse that has fallen straight from heaven, as it were, but is something that is already very clearly prefigured, at least as a potential in the context of contemporary thought. I am referring here to the concept of ideal type in the work of Max Weber, and to the concept of essence developed by Edmund Husserl, and subsequently extended by the phenomenological movement to specific material areas of experience. Now the concept of ideal type in Max Weber is an attempt to manage without system, and indeed Max Weber possessed no system, and you will not find a general overarching concept of society itself in the entire theory presented in his economy and society. Nonetheless, Max Weber felt the need to move beyond any merely isolating form of scientific observation, and his conception of Verstehen or understanding is itself an anti-positivist concept, and one which was also criticized by other sociologists. For indeed, to understand something already means that we have not allowed it to stand simply as a factum, as a mere factum, since precisely by understanding it, by discovering meaning in it, I render it intelligible in relation to something else, something which, is, which it itself is not. Now it is in this connection that Max Weber introduces the remarkable concept of ideal type, which is then supposed, once it is concretely developed, to indicate the universal context in which the particular falls, without thereby claiming that this relationship actually exists. For this is supposed to be a purely heuristic device, that is, it is supposed to allow individual phenomena, such as individual forms of economy, to be compared with capitalism as an ideal type and thus to be conceptually articulated in turn. And once the ideal type has fulfilled this organizing role and perhaps even been refuted by the facts, it can be relinquished or can now just go, like Schiller's famous Moore, once he has done his duty. And the number of ideal types is in principle infinite, for I can form as many ideal types as I wish, according to Weber. The purpose of such types is solely the practical scientific one of providing a means of organization. You can clearly see here how he attempted to deploy a type of thinking which comes extraordinarily close to the concept of model I have introduced in this context. It is just that he did nonetheless basically retain a certain positivist conception.
since for him the universal in relation to the particular is ultimately nothing but an abbreviated expression of characteristic features, and he completely fails to see how the universal essentially inhabits the particular, which is precisely what we have been trying to grasp here in specific epistemological terms. Thus, this ray of, rec this ray of cognition, which sees what is ultimately essential in the phenomenon, becomes a merely ancillary operation in which no trust is actually placed, something entirely without substance, since its object, the encompassing universal itself, is supposed to be without substance, and the model in question is relinquished after all. In other words, the concept of model as a weighty epistemological category is effectively replaced in Max Weber by a pre-dialectical model of knowledge which reflects the perspective of traditional logic. And we find something comparable, if you like, in the phenomenology of Edmund Husserl, at least in this regard, for there are indeed countless other facets to phenomenology which cannot be considered here. For Husserl believes that with an individual object I am able to intuit its essence, its pure quiditas, that which makes it precisely what it is through a process of leaving out the effectively contingent aspect of the object. And that I can do this without, refer without referring to a multiplicity of objects of the same kind, and without abstracting the element they have in common. And he quite rightly realized that the concept which allows the individual thing to be illuminated, which allows us to grasp it in its essential character, to grasp it precisely as it is, that this concept is not the same as the ordering concept under which a series of objects can be encompassed in terms of a merely formal unity. It is just that Husserl too, like Weber, shrank back from the decisive step towards dialectic insofar as he also remained oriented to, tradi to traditional logic, insofar as he effectively conceives what I intuit in and through the individual object. The essence that is illuminated for me, the model, as it were, in which the individual object appears to me, once again has nothing but the universal concept of that object. He had no other notion of essence itself than the universal concept under which individual objects can be grasped, and simply believed that, in a mode of cognition that resembles a model, this universal reveals itself to me in and through the particular. But this universality, for its part, was still understood in terms of the usual classificatory logic, with the result that his own theory of essences got caught up in the greatest difficulties. Since this universal, the ordering class concept in which the individual moments are included is of course precisely what I can never intuit out of the individual thing. If you consider for a moment this concept of model which I have, which I have tried to suggest to you here, the attempt to let the illumination of particular moments cast its light upon other things in turn, and if you try to think this concept further, you will immediately recognize an essential feature of these models which philosophy undertakes to develop, and I must confess here that everything that I do in the way of philosophy, every word that I publish, is not some attempt to deal exhaustively with a certain field, but solely an attempt to develop models, which could indeed cast a distinctive light upon an entire field, a light that also alters and determines that entire field in a particular way. And in all of my own contributions, whether they are good for anything or not, I always orient myself very strictly by this concept of models. You will recognize that this concept of models only, possess, only possesses any meaning if it successfully forfeits its mere isolation, if it really also points beyond itself, if in some way it redeems the claim that the particular that has been illuminated here is itself something universal. And the question of how we redeem the claim of particular and specific cognition to a certain universality that, I would say, is the, is the specific problem of knowledge which dialectical thought must confront today. But if we do not wish our individual models simply to stand side by side in an isolated and unconnected manner, like so many little pictures, which was once a critical object to phenomenology, and one could also say the same for Weber's idea types, this cannot be accomplished by bringing these models under some overall concept such as a world view or a general position, or again by gathering them into some supposedly systematic form, by fitting them into a system, 
I would say that the requisite communication between them is best accomplished not by bringing them all under a common denominator, but by sinking subterranean passages, as it were, or by somehow opening doors into these subterranean passages from each individual instance of knowledge. In this way, these models can connect with one another, indeed connect subterraneously, as I would like to put it, without this interconnection between imposed or being imposed upon them by the arbitrary demands of organizational thought. The interconnection here must emerge out of the complexion of the matter itself, and is something over which the thinker has no actual power, and I would almost say that it is a further criterion of truth, an indication of the wealth and binding character of knowledge, whether this communication of the individual models is produced in and through itself, as it were, or can only be, pr be produced in an external superficial manner. If I once wrote that it is a genuine indication of trustworthy work that draws forth its requisite quotations spontaneously, as it were, that it tempts them to come forward of themselves, this is precisely what I was trying to capture. Thus I would say that the interconnection of thought, the interconnection of knowledge, achieved through such models, which actually accomplishes what earlier ages had once expected from the idea of system, that such interconnection displays the character of a labyrinth rather than that of a system, and I once formulated a claim which those of you who have read these things must surely have found rather shocking, or at least highly thought-provoking, and it is this, true thoughts are those alone which do not understand themselves, and it is very easy just to say, well then it's also obvious from such philosophy that it cannot actually understand itself. Now I would not deny anyone their delight in such an aperçu, but I wanted to express very clearly precisely what I have just been trying to bring out for you here, and I would ask you to take what I am saying as an interpretation of that earlier claim. And perhaps you will also see here that such claims are not actually apersus, although they may initially strike you like that, and not merely pointed remarks either, for, the, for they occupy a very precise place within a continuous line of thought. For I wanted to say that actually only those thoughts are true which communicate with other thoughts by virtue of their own intrinsic gravity, while those thoughts are not true which are captured in a superficial general concept, which are merely classified and subsumed under an abstract universal, and thus can already only be determined as a particular case, or mere example of a universal, whereby they naturally lose the very salt which makes knowledge into genuine knowledge in the first place. If I may perhaps use an analogy from literature to suggest what I mean by that distinctive labyrinthine character of knowledge, which seems to me to be quite indispensable today for knowledge which really is such, knowledge which is interconnected but not systematic, then I believe that Kafka's novels, or indeed Kafka's work as a whole, actually possess in this regard a very precise epistemological function, while I may also note in passing for those of you with a specific interest in literature, that Kafka's works, by virtue of their close affinity to parables, cannot be assimilated into the category of works of art. What I mean is that, if you read Kafka attentively, you will not be able to shake off the feeling that all these novels and stories communicate with one another in some kind of way, and this not on account of the single personality that supposedly stands behind them, or of a single pervasive mood. And in Kafka's honor, we should point out right away that there is no such thing as a mood in his works, or even as some worldview they allegedly contain, for these novels are far too significant in themselves even to think of expressing that kind of content. This is all so much, this is all so much nonsense, the sort of thing you can read in the wake of Broad and Shops, for example. What we actually encounter, on the contrary, is a, is a remarkably coherent and internally connected world, which nonetheless eludes any attempt to grasp it as a unity, and which appears in a multiplicity of facets to which this thought returns again and again. And it is this labyrinthian element alone which allows knowledge to address the infinite character of living experience, without either truncating it or blindly submitting to it and which represents one of the impulses of the great form of the novel generally. And if we wish to write a logic and epistemology of the great novels, which God knows would be an important thing worth reading or worth doing, 
Then we could also discover a, labyrinth a labyrinthine form of communication between particulars in the work of Balzac, which is very similar to that which I have pointed out in Kafka. And if, I'm, if I may introduce a completely different kind of writer from our own time here, then I would say that the work of Hemido von Dotterer and its general structure is entirely pervade, pervaded by this labyrinthine character. Allow me simply to add here that this labyrinthine dimension indeed has something essentially to do with the structure of society as the ultimate object in question, and also as the ultimate constitutive subject of knowledge itself. For in fact, we live in a society in which everything effectively communicates with everything else in a specific functional context, but where this intercommunicative context itself is in a certain sense irrational, that is to say, is by no means transparent. For it manifests itself in a particular kind of compulsion where one thing finds its way to another without the overall concept of the whole, the system which everything obeys, ever clearly revealing itself as such. What I mean is that our thoughts, without reflecting upon themselves in terms of their universal determinacy, are necessarily driven beyond themselves, and almost always lose what they actually intend by allowing themselves to be reduced to a generic universal concept. I have already spoken about the concept of intuition in extremely critical terms at an earlier point in these lectures. If the notion of insight is to tell us anything over and beyond the purely subjective character of particular kinds of thought, if insight is to mean more than the fact that we just suddenly see something, then I would say that it always actually signifies just this moment when a thought is not produced on the basis of the relevant abstract generic concept. But where it is related, I would almost say, as an individual thought to a concrete object, while also pointing beyond itself and releasing the power which allows the individual moments to hang together in their subcutaneous and actually hidden uh, structure. But I would now like to turn to the concept of system, which is effectively implied by Descartes axiom of completeness. And the first thing I would like to say to you in order to bring the discussion regarding the concept of system in relation to its contemporary form, its contemporary manifestation, is that the philosophical conception of system itself in terms of its inner structure has already undergone decisive historical change. And I think it would be well worth investigating the various transformations to which the concept of system itself has been subjected. I don't exactly want to begin with Adam and Eve, and will therefore restrict myself here to modern philosophy, to the history of philosophy since Kant. And in this context, it looks as if what the concept of system is basically meant to do, and the fact of the sheer multiplicity and irrationality, the sheer opacity and contingency of things, is precisely to secure the moment of unity, and this minimal but necessary unity of thought which can assert itself against this otherwise overwhelming sense of contingency is what precisely Kant understands by system. In those significant philosophies which developed in response to Kant and in the most extreme degree in the philosophy of Hegel, who has inevitably furnished the thematic angle of orientation for these lectures, we find that the claim of systematicity is immeasurably extended in comparison to that starting point. For what we see here is ultimately an attempt to develop the entire abundance of reality itself, the abundance of everything that exists out of the pure concept, in other words, out of spirit. And since this is posited in identity with spirit, since spirit generates everything out of itself, there is a sense in which spirit thereby also has everything at its call, and is thereby the master of everything that it is. Thus everything now stands within and nothing is left out of that complete context that was already postulated by, De by Descartes. Yet this context and this point reflects one of the deepest impulses of post-Kantian philosophy, in no longer the somewhat reified context which was conceived by Descartes in accordance with a definitely mathematical schema. For the context in question here, by contrast, is that of the self-production of the whole. In other words, the system is complete, not in the sense of bringing everything that exists under a single denominator, as it were, but rather by attempting to produce everything out of itself, out of this Kantian point of unity, namely out of the synthesis of apperception, so that system is now the comprehensive totality of productive spirit, 
which is certainly of itself, or the native realm of truth as Hegelian philosophy describes it. Now, if we can speak with some justification of a backward-looking development or a certain regressive movement on the part of bourgeois thought, this also applies to the concept of system itself. In other words, once the original claim of identity philosophy had collapsed in the course of post-Hegelian thought, we find that the concept of system effectively goes to the dogs. If I may put it that way, for it now returns to what it was before, namely to being merely an organizational schema. St systematicity now means something, or now means nothing but the attempt to classify everything as completely as possible, to leave nothing at all out, and in the end, as we can typically see in the contemporary situation, the concept of philosophical system or the system provided by each individual science, in fact, just becomes a mold or frame, as it were, for administrative purposes, a procedural outline, in short, a schema, in which everything that could possibly come before the bureaucrats of thought will find its appointed place in order to be efficiently dealt with. In our next session, we shall say more about the specific development and especially about the characteristic problems, the philosophical problems, which this poses for dialectical thought. And in this connection, we shall also give particular attention to the now popular notion of a frame of reference.